Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Today we're talking about something super important to every single one of you, which is your thyroid health. And now you may be thinking, I don't have a thyroid problem, Karen, but you may have what's called a metabolic problem, which does have to do with your thyroid. And we're gonna be talking to two of the top experts when it comes to thyroid health and metabolic health. My guests today are Josh and Jeannie Rubin. I've actually never interviewed two people at one time, so this is very exciting, you guys. Josh and Jeannie Rubin are the founders of East West Healing. You can find them at eastwesthealing.com. Josh and Jeannie have taken the concept of food as medicine to a whole new level. As pioneers in the area of restoring metabolic health, Josh and Jeannie are revolutionizing nutrition for thyroid health by teaching people how to use food as supplementation to reduce stress and build the most sound foundation for the body to heal. So welcome Josh and Jeannie Rubin. Thank you. It's great to be here with you. <laughs> yes. Um, I was just saying before we go on the air that these two really talk my talk, and I'm really excited for you guys to hear. Um, they're just their concept on metabolic healing and thyroid health, and it's just something that I'm super passionate about myself. So let's start first with, you know, maybe Josh, you could tell us where you guys came from because you were like a lot of other nutritionists you kind of were stuck in a bit of the you know one track thinking about what it took to lose weight and things shifted for you and you shifted your practice so can you talk to me a little bit about how that happened i i could be speaking for you but i think we came from kind of the same area like I started and she did too with the Czech Institute. I went up through their courses and ended up teaching for him. So that was kind of the base of where I started. Now, of course, throughout there, I got different certs and educational things based on nutrition. But that's kind of where I started back in 2001. I think I took my first course with him. Um, you know, and it was always nutritional based. It was always looking at the person, always looking at nutrition. You know, and through the process, I think just fast forwarding it, we got to a place while where we were really looking at each individual, doing labs, etc. But we started to notice that the industry was so focused, you know, this is 19 years ago, on supplements and labs. And when we started working with people, we weren't really seeing people focusing on food and everyone was focusing on all the wrong things. And of course, that spiraled out of control, you know, with all the diets today, candida, SIBO, gut diets, dysbiosis, gut diets, and extreme dieting that everyone's doing. You know, so when we met 14 years ago, you know, that's <laughs> He's when, like, is that right, wife? That's, is that <laughs> that's when you know we kind of came together and really saw each other's strengths and weaknesses and said, you focused on this, I'll focus on this. And it really just took off. And that's when we really came together and said, what people are doing isn't working. Everyone's chasing symptoms. No yeah. one's focusing on the foundation. And without that, nothing else can work. And that's kind of where we went from that point. 15 years ago, you know, yeah. because if you look at everyone, everyone's searching for the next best diet, yeah. everyone's searching for weight loss, everyone's searching for what supplement or lab they can do instead of saying, what are my basic needs? I need to meet my basic needs first. And if they're not met, honestly, nothing else is going to work. Yeah. That's why this nutrition web is out of control right now. Right? Yeah. And it's, you said this, you know, 19 years ago, you saw this and unfortunately things have gotten a million times worse about what you're mm -hmm. talking about as far as like people getting it onto the next best diet and, or supplement and they, they're still looking for a quick fix, bottom line. And it's only getting worse where people are not wanting to put the work in. My sister just was at our naturopath and she was in getting an IV therapy done and she's with all these like super sick people with lupus and autoimmune conditions and they're all doing these IVs and she's like um so what are you guys doing for your nutrition like she's really into nutrition and and none of them had been put on any sort of like healthy just even just a healthy eating program and she was like why aren't these people just simply eating better why, why is it that that can't be the foundation right now right. and it's we really have gotten so far away from that foundation of nutrition. So talk to, let's, let's talk about the metabolism. Explain, explain the metabolism and how it works and how it relates to the thyroid genie. 
Sure. Well, your metabolism is basically how your body is able to take all of the food that you could have, that comes in and is able to metabolize it into energy. And what we're seeing today is that most people, because of the circumstances of society, we're living in a very fast paced world. We are very confused about what, what nourishes our body. Um, we are, we are seeing people in states of complete adrenal fatigue that's shutting down their thyroid. Right? We know that the thyroid affects every single tissue in the cell. It affects how our body's producing energy. We need that glucose oxygen in order to be able to produce energy. So we're looking at that and saying, okay, well, if stress is the body's perceived need for sugar <laughs> and glucose is necessary to be able to produce energy, how do we begin to build the system back up and reestablish re the energy foundation? Right? Mm -hmm. How do we get the body out of this stress state and bring it back into an energy producing state. And we're looking at that through our nutrition. That is the way that we're intended to be able to regulate our bodies, to be able to regulate our hormones, right? So until we're able to shut down that adrenal, um, stress. That, that, that adrenal stress, will we be able to re re restore energy systems, right? Yeah. So we're just yeah. looking at it from that perspective. I mean, when we say thyroid health, we're, we say <laughs> thyroid health because it's tangible. Yes. Right. right. If we say, yeah, we're helping people regulate how our cells convert, th you know, use thyroid hormone to produce energy. Most people are like, I don't understand that. Right. So that's yeah. really what we're doing. It, it's, yeah. it's essentially like how well are you putting logs on your fire to keep your house warm throughout the day? Right. That's your metabolism. And if you're throwing on paper or sticks, right, you're going to have to do it very often or the heat that's produced isn't going to last long. So there's a difference between eating a healthy diet and saying it's healthy just because someone says it's healthy, as well as eating healthy foods and saying it's healthy diet because they're healthy foods and we could go on and on, right? Mm -hmm. um, or saying what I'm eating is actually working for my body based on how I feel, based on my symptoms and based on how my cells are producing energy. Because if you're eating in a way and living in a way and it's really supporting you, you're going to see that. The body never lies. Right. So just right. unfortunately feeling better. Right. is not an indication of health. Right. It's, it's, it's a, well, I think it's you're a, saying that the, the absence of a symptom right. is not right. The definition right. of health. And I think that's the more important thing because if somebody isn't experiencing a, that symptom, which is that fourth step in the disease process, right. Which is there's only five. <laughs> so we've, we've had an accumulative process up to that point. We seem to believe that there's nothing wrong where well, we can look, at first glance at somebody, let's say body temperature and pulse and know exactly what's happening physiologically in that system, which then gives us an opportunity to begin to understand what that means to blood sugar regulation, cortisol rhythms, how the digestion, I'm sorry, digestive system is being affected, the effects it's having on the immune system. We can see so much if we're able to regulate blood sugar, convert energy, the state of the adrenals. It's, it's it just a timeline, though. Right? It's a timeline. So if you're eating healthy and you're like, I feel great, this is ridiculous, but you're waking up with a temperature that's 96, the, the news is it's not working for you. It's not working for your cells because right. your cells, you have 50 trillion in your body. Thyroid hormone is the only hormone that can affect them, and they drive every system. If your cells produce energy, there's a feedback loop that's created biochemically, which drives how your systems work together in a relationship, right? But if yeah. you're not producing energy, you're actually slowly moving into inflammation. So you might not feel bad today and the diet worked for you today, but guess what? Three months to three years, whatever it is, depending on your resiliency, you're going to get to that place and you're going to feel how what you're doing is not working for you. And I'll say, Karen, because I know you do speak to a lot of women, perimenopause and menopause is that threshold for yeah. so many women. It's like, so Oh many. my gosh, all of a sudden what's happened to me where it's been many, many years of us just not really understanding how our cells are breathing, how our bodies are producing energy, how we are being affected by the environment, not only physically, but mentally, emotionally from day one of conception and sometimes preceding that. Yeah. Right. So we're yeah. looking at such we're, we're looking really when we when we peer into that body temperature and pulse, what we're yeah. really seeing is the state of a nervous system. Right. Yes. And, and that's, I wanna, 
Yeah. yeah. I, I want you guys to explain that because I think a lot of people listening don't know what we're talking about. I do because I'm hypothyroid and I tell every single person I work with, you have to take your temperature. And they're like, well, but I don't have a thyroid problem. My doctor says my thyroid's fine. So for those listening that think that they don't have a thyroid problem yet, they're gaining this weight and they don't feel good and they're sluggish and tired and they got hormone dysfunction. Why are we taking the temperature and what is that telling us exactly about the adrenal system as well as our metabolism? Well, here's the thing. Most people, we've been doing this work 20 years. Most people don't have a true thyroid issue. They're being diagnosed with it, right? Yep. Um, based on a lab, unfortunately, very incomplete lab, just TSH. That's not going to tell you if you have hyper or hypothyroidism. And hyperthyroidism is super rare, like less than 0.5% of the population is going to have it, right? You might have the symptoms of it. doesn't mean you have it. Um, so when I say hypothyroidism, I mean true thyroid issue, your thyroid is having issue producing thyroid hormone. We don't see that a lot. I've probably seen in 20 years less than five people. And we see it based on their labs and body temperature pulse readings and patterns over a three-month period of time. And usually what it looks like is they wake up with, you know, normal body temperature pulse is 97.8 to 98.6. Pulse would be like 70 to 85, somewhere in there. Um, so they wake up at, let's say, 96, right? And they have a low pulse or a high pulse, doesn't matter. And they work with us. No matter what they do, what they change, how they adapt, that temperature and pulse barely shifts over a three-month period of time. We know they have a thyroid issue. Thyroid is not producing hormone. That's why we're not seeing that energy shift within their body temperature and pulse, which is not something we made up. It's based off the work of Broder Barnes. You're really looking at how your cells are using T3 to produce energy, which is ATP and CO2, right? So what we're saying is most people have a functional hypothyroidism issue, whether it's a pituitary issue, meaning stress, inhibiting thyroid hormone conversion, whether it's from being on the pill or not detoxifying estrogen, which is affecting thyroid hormone conversion, whether increased stress is increasing reverse T3, which is binding up receptor sites, which is affecting thyroid hormone conversion. Whether people are on thyroid medication, they don't need it, and they create a thyroid resistance, which creates a thyroid conversion issue. So it doesn't matter where it's coming from. We're seeing conversion issues. So the thyroid's producing it, but there's something blocking it, or you're not supporting it with glycogen, because you need glycogen to convert thyroid hormone. You know, the liver stores glycogen. It also converts like 80% of thyroid hormone in the body. Why? Because that's where glycogen's stored. Mm -hmm. So it uses it to convert T4 inactive to active T3 hormone, thyroid hormone, which is yeah. used in our cells. Um, so when we see functional, we see that um, conversion issue. Thyroid's fine. We're just seeing a conversion issue. And what we see is we see it in the labs, full lab, but we see instabilities in their temps and pulses. And that's how we know they don't have a true thyroid issue. Mm -hmm. That instability is just energy. We get energy or we don't get energy. Sometimes we feed it. Sometimes we get the conversion. Sometimes we don't. And that's why we see that instability throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And that's that blood sugar. Um, Jeannie, maybe you know this part. Uh, do you see that in women's, when you're taking their, their temperature through their cycle, there's in the first half of the cycle, the temperature stays quite low, like quite a bit lower compared to the second half of the cycle in so many women. Do you, is this normal or is this telling us something about the hormones in the first part of the cycle? It can be, well, it's telling us again about the state of the physiology, which is going to directly affect the hormones, right? So if a woman is, again, in a, in a hypometabolic state, low thyroid, right, they're going to have a hard time potentially producing progesterone, which is going to put them in what we would look at as more like estrogen dominance, which is really a progesterone deficiency, right, which can, again, create issues with the body being able to detoxify estrogen, the reabsorption of estrogen, as well as ovulation and what we might see in the latter part of the cycles, right? So we can determine whether or not somebody's having an ovulatory cycles or they're, if they're really ovulating. Um, or we can see when somebody has like a luteal fail and their progesterone drops much earlier. We can see when somebody's having a hard time with the balance of estrogen to progesterone with the lower body temperatures in the beginning of the cycle. It's normal that we'll see them on the lower end, but we still should be able to come up into norm. And yep. it's really the patterns that we're observing 
whether or not somebody can regulate hormonally throughout their cycle. But one of the things that we are able to watch are where the hormonal imbalances are from the follicular to ovulation through the luteal phases. So we can begin to support it differently with nutrition. Because one of the things that we do often see is that women need different nutritional support at different yeah. phases of their cycle, right? Wow. To meet their energy demands because of, again, the different effects estrogen will have on the body versus progesterone, which is much more heat, which is energy demanding, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I, wanted so, to, I wanted to say that. I think it's important because I think we get, as clients, we get so wrapped up and becoming practitioners and in, in, in treating our healing process like a chemistry experiment without truly understanding the baseline of what physiology is. So when you look at your cycle, estrogen here, progesterone here, this is what it looks like in the beginning. Estrogen is a hypothermic hormone. It's going to be, it's a colder, I'm just simplifying cold it. inducing. It's a cold saying. inducing hormone. So it's normal to have lower temperatures in the beginning of the cycle. As you go into ovulation, they shift, right? It doesn't mean your estrogen dominant here, right? They shift. That's why you see temps go up because progesterone is more thermogenic. So it's natural to mm -hmm. see that fluctuation. So don't go, oh, they're lower. You know, there's something wrong with me. It's normal. If your temperatures are like, you know, in the bucket, like 96, yes, that's too low. So just right. keep that in mind. We don't want to just go, oh, they're low. There's something wrong with me. It normally should be low. Yeah, right. so it's better to, if you're going to be tracking your temperature, to would you guys recommend doing it kind of every day for a month or? No, I think for women to really get their baseline metabolically, they're going to want to track on their second or third day of their cycle to really understand what's going on from a thyroid, hormone, adrenal, nervous system perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, they're going to get a clear picture of that because they're going to still see those elevations in temperatures. But again, are they having luteal fail? What's going on there? Is their temperature really increasing? Are we getting a lot of fluctuations? Which could again indicate why there may be more of a progesterone deficiency, estrogen dominance. But the whole goal is always to regulate the hormones through our nutrition and our lifestyle, which will always see those things recover over time. Mm -hmm. One of the, one of the things that Diana Schwartz minds and it's one of Jeannie's favorite quotes is like, "Your metabolism controls your hormones, and you control your metabolism." No. No. Your hormones. <laughs> I knew I was going to say it wrong. <laughs> Good try, Josh. <laughs> control your metabolism but you control your hormones exactly. and that's what I love so much is because women don't understand how much control they have over what's happening hormonally in their body right. wow. there's yeah. so many women who don't understand the hormones right yeah. and what's happening in different phases or the expectations that we have or again understanding that stress is going to block progesterone production, right? If your body's always going to prioritize the state that it's in, and if you're in for survival, progestation, digestion, all of those things get put to the back burner because they're not priority, right? That, so that's begin the big, to understand where, we, where those imbalances begin to develop. That's the bigger piece of what we're looking at. And most people don't talk about this. Yeah. I mean, it's really deep in like polyvagal theory. Yeah. Those people talk about it and they go deep in it, but we're applying it to the people in front of us in nutrition. And people have to realize that if you're being chased by a lion every day, and you're tired, and you have hormone issues, and you have digestion issues, and you're constipated, that's normal. Your body's adapting to the demands that are being placed on it, right? You're go, go, going, you're overworking, you're overtraining, you're stressed, you know, financially, whatever it may be. Of course, your body's going to start to break down. It's like being on that roller coaster and never getting off. Right, it's going to take a toll on your body, and that's unfortunately where people are at. People are going from that parasympathetic state that everyone talks about, which is that rest and digest, right, respiration, heart rate. That's our regulatory state, and they're moving into that sympathetic state. The problem is we shouldn't live there, right? That's that running from a lion or being on a roller coaster place. That's a, a mobilization state. We're not meant to live there. We need to be able to adapt have the tools and resources to adapt to get back to that parasympathetic state, right? Just because you meditate doesn't mean you're going to get back there, right? So we have to have the tools to get back there. If we don't, we keep going. We actually move into a more primitive state, which is actually part of the parasympathetic nervous system. That's a mobilization freeze. We're disconnected and we feel this is where most people are at. Yeah. We see people with digestive issues, right? This is that part of the vagus nerve. It's, 
digestion, everything below the nervous system. We see people, they don't know how to feel. They're disconnected. They're frozen. They don't know which diet to do, right? Our society is confused because they're in that, that part of the nervous system. So we're trying to teach them that food is not just the answer, right? We have to look at how we're living, how we're breathing. What's our day like? We have to change to create change. And the only way you're going to move back up to the top homeostatically, right, is to eat in a way that reduces the stress response, allows us to store energy and get that feedback mechanism going. Because anytime you produce energy, that auto-regulates the nervous system. It increases vagal tone, which simplifies, it actually increases that parasympathetic control. So on a deeper sense, that's what we're doing. We're having people look at like, wow, yeah, I'm trying to eat healthy, but you know, I have five kids, I wake up, I go, 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 I don't eat all day, and then I go to the gym, and I'm doing the seed rotation, I don't understand why it's not working. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, I'm, I'm taking this supplement. I'm not sure why I'm taking my right. adrenal complex. Not I'm not work. sure why I'm not feeling better. It's not going to work because mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're taking as of supplements, the best probiotic in the world. You've heard it, you know, yes. you're doing the labs or the e-course, but you're still on the roller coaster. Right. You have to get off the roller coaster. And the problem or the hardest piece is we're actually teaching people or saying, Hey, we're going to create this space. And you have to actually step up the plate and get vulnerable and say, these are the pieces and parts of my life that don't work for me anymore. And I have to change them. And it's not just food. And that's hard for people. Well, it's so hard. Yeah, we're asking people to look at their rhythms, right? Yeah. To look at, you know, we obviously know that eating this diet or that diet is not the answer. It's looking at, okay, what's my, how are my cells breathing? First of all, how am I waking up? I'm waking up in the red. Okay, my energy tank is in the red, most of us have borrowed against it on top of that, right? And in that state, again, you're either producing, uh, you're producing energy or you're producing inflammation. Simple. That's yeah. it, right? So if you're in that state and we know the only way to pull the body out of that state is to give it nourishment, right? Mm -hmm. To feed the body, <laughs> we give it that nourishment, but we also understand that in that state, because physiologically, that's a neurologically adapted state, that it's going to take time, consistency, and establishing that rhythm to understand when your body needs to be fed up against the demands of your life, right? Mm -hmm. And how your body perceives that. Because again, we all have stories behind us. So how we experience our environment is very different. So what we're doing is we're putting people right up front with it. Here's the feedback. Here's what your body's showing us. Now, how does that feel for you. So we're also asking them to feel. What are you noticing digestively? What are you noticing about your, your emotions, your relationships, how your work is affecting you, how the weather is affecting you, how your kids are making you nuts, your husband's a jerk, whatever it might be. You know what I mean? How is that affecting you and how do you meet that in a new way so that it stops breaking you down, mm -hmm. right? And compromising you instead of building you up and creating something that's a little bit more, again, regulating of the system, reducing those stress hormones and creating more stability mm -hmm. hormonally in the body. Yeah. But it, it makes sense. I mean, look at when we start, when I first started in this industry, it was just teaching people how to eat organic food. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it spiraled yeah. out of control. Right. And now we have diet upon diet upon diet that meets the needs of our addictive society. Yeah. I was going to say, because that's, that's, that's what sells, unfortunately. Yeah. Right? And it pushes you deeper into that frozen disconnected state. Yeah. And people will say, well, whatever, I feel great. We ask people all the time, how do you feel? People are like, I don't know how I feel. Especially women. Right? We've never been asked. Mm -hmm. They don't know their mm -hmm. cycle. They don't know how they feel. They don't know what their body needs. We see it because people will eat two meals and they say, I'm dizzy and I'm this, and they go to the gym. Right? If you were able to connect, you'd be like, well, maybe I shouldn't go to the gym and, and go to CrossFit because it's probably not the best decision to support my system. But that's hard for people to do because the underlying, and I know this. The, I'll, I'll stop for it. Go ahead. The underlying <laughs> is, issue is everyone is searching for a diet to lose weight. Yes. Right? Well, yes. No one's searching for a diet to get healthy. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is saying, just because you lose weight doesn't mean you're healthy. And that's a harsh reality for people because we think losing weight is healthy. We work with so many skinny people that just don't feel good, right? So we're trying to help people say, 
you will lose weight if you get healthy, but we have to get healthy first. We have to change the environment. We have to look at how you're living and saying, what's not serving me anymore and create new habits and behaviors. And how do we eat in a way or breathe in a way to really support our body to get us back to that, that balance point parasympathetic system because we, so we can increase our adaptability and increase our resiliency and get our body out of that stress state 24 seven. And I think just to, just to kind of add to what Josh is saying, as far as being in that state, again, the body's prioritizing. So when it's sensing it's running for its life, weight loss again is not a priority, right? No. Keeping our vital organs functioning is top priority at this, at this stage of the game, right? But if it does happen, it's completely catabolic. Right. Mm-hmm. right and people can say whatever all that well listen what happens when you're on a diet i don't care if it's keto veganism whatever and you change and you go back to eating like a human what happens to 99.9 percent of the people they gain weight, they gain weight yeah. and they go carbs are the enemy <laughs> they're not it's your body's inability to break them down because of so much metabolic damage that you created Exactly. Right? Yeah. So we're just trying to help people find that balance and say, food doesn't control me. I'm not obsessive about my health. Health is easy. I just have to wake up every day and make the best decisions for myself. I'm not saying it's easy because it's about creating new healthy habits, right? And for a lot of people, that's hard to look at in the mirror. But we we support people, but it's really about doing those things to get your body back to health instead of chasing symptoms all the time. Yeah. Oh God. I love you guys. I could just sit here and listen to you all day. You're just like, this is so great. I, I preach the exact same stuff every day to on this podcast, in my groups, to my clients. Um, so I really want to get into, because you touched on it a little bit, but all the rage right now is of course, very low carb diets, ketogenic diets, fasting. And I've used them in my practice for years. I've had great success with them, but I've also seen people take it too far where they have seriously damaged their metabolism. And exactly what you just said, Josh, they try to start eating normally again, or they just have a little, you know, a couple of weeks where maybe they're not on their keto diet and they have become extra sensitive now to carbohydrates where it's just like instant weight gain. And then they're like, okay, well, I better lower my calories. I better fast more. I better go carnivore. And, you know, don't get me wrong, listeners. There's a, these are all great tools to have in your toolbox. And I've, like I said, I've seen them heal many people from metabolic disorder, insulin resistance, but you can take this too far and you have to listen to your body and you have to start checking in because you can be causing damage. It's one of the reasons I always say, if you're going to do low carb, you have to be mixing it with carb days where you're eating those carb ops, especially if there's a thyroid and adrenal issue. So can you guys please touch on why that's so important? Like, what is it, what are these low carb fads doing to our thyroid and adrenal health, because right now, who doesn't have an, a thyroid and an well, adrenal issue, right? Right. Well, just speaking to the point of macronutrients and then the human body, is if we take our primary energy source away, yeah. right? Yeah. We're doomed. <laughs> and that's what's happening is we're taking our primary energy source away and out of the equation because of the reactions that people are getting from them, thinking that that's the issue and not acknowledging that it's the state of the physiology. And I think what you're saying, Karen, is that it's not sustainable, yeah. right? They can be used therapeutically, but they are not sustainable diets. And that's where I think the confusion lies is because we see these fantastic results with weight loss and think that yeah. this is, ha oh, this is it, right? But again, we have to go back to why are we struggling with losing weight in the first place, right? Mm-hmm. What's the state of the system? And then again, how do we bring it back full circle to that place of balance and moderation versus so heavy to end, one end of the spectrum versus the other? Yes. And we don't live in a balanced society. That's not what we're being shown every single day. We're either hard this way or hard that way, and there is no gray area, right? Mm-hmm. Because we're so focused on fixing, fixing, yes. fixing, fixing, and doing, doing, doing instead of being and observing and giving things space, right? Because most people are so heavily compressed as it is, and they just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. So that's going a little off topic, and I know he's chomping at the bit over here. (laughs) I can tell. (laughs) Let's hear it, Josh. (laughs) No, I mean, I I think 
I think there it's it there's two pieces to it. Um oh my god, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, I think I'm well, let me just say something. This might trigger it. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of document, there's so much information right now where people are like, keto is this preferred, uh, or ketones are a preferred fuel for the body. Yeah. What I say is, well, if we're looking at hunter-gatherer times, actually, we, we were able to uh, adapt to ketones and use ketones as a backup system not as a primary sense of fuel. It was a survival thing. It was if we were in famine, if there was not a lot of food around, then we could burn our fat stores and we weren't, it would cause our hunger to go down so we weren't starving because there was no fruit and whatever else, that things to eat so your, around your us. your point is really important. Yeah, it's, it's so really I, important. I think it's two, there's two points. If you wanna lose weight fast, I will agree, do keto, but you're also gonna damage your metabolism. Keto is not a sustainable way of eating and living right? It's yeah. not. Trust me, at some point down the line, whether it's one month or one year, you are going to tank. Whether it's your energy, the hormones, whether it's your thyroid, it will happen. I promise you it'll happen. And I say this because almost every single person we talk to has fasted, done keto, low carb, etc. It's going to happen. It's not sustainable. Why? Your, your cell's primary source of fuel, your brain's primary source of fuel, you can Google it. You can look in a book. It's there. It is glucose. For some reason along the, the way, and I want to try to say this as compassionate as I can, the keto community has been brainwashed to believe that fat and ketones are a primary source of fuel. It is not. But let me say this. In a very, let's say, balanced homeostatic state, sitting here, not running around. Fat is your primary source of fuel. Why? Because I don't need to produce a lot of energy. I don't need to produce a long, sustained amount of energy, right? I'm not exercising. I'm not moving. I'm not doing something, right? So it is supposed to be. But there's a difference between fats we're talking about, right? Are we talking about brown fat, white fat, etc.? Brown fat is a very important source of energy for the body. That's like your, your, baby fat, right? That's brown fat. It's a very metabolic fat. When we produce more energy, we produce more brown fat. The problem is as we age, stress, diets, etc., the love handles, you know, the man boobs, the gut, right? The back fat, that's all white fat. White fat doesn't produce energy. It stores energy, right? And the problem with white fat is it's actually anti-metabolic, right? And the more metabolic we get and the more brown fat we create, it actually eats white fat. We, create, we actually lose weight in a healthy way. So brown fat can be used as energy efficiently, but white fat is not. So I don't understand where it came from. I, I know this is where anytime we post anything keto or low carb, there's always an argument, and I just ignore people. But your, your fats, your proteins, your ketones are backup sources for being in a stress state, right? You're in a stress state, you don't have stored glycogen in your muscles, you're not storing glycogen you know, in your liver from eating fructose from fruit. Your body's gonna go, I need energy, because if I don't produce energy, essentially you're gonna die. This is how it works. So it's like a car with no fuel, it's not gonna move. So the body says, let me, through a piece of the sympathetic nervous system, let me release adrenaline right? That's through the sympathetic adrenal medullary system. Then milliseconds later, right? HPA axis kicks in. You're going to release cortisol. That breaks down proteins and fats. That's where the fats and proteins are used for energy. That is a stress response. That's not a normal response. We shouldn't live in that roller coaster survival mode all the time. Can you use it as energy? Sure, but it's not efficient, right? That's why you have to eat three to 400 grams of fat a day in keto to get energy, right? You don't need three to 400 grams of carbs a day for energy, unless you're a professional athlete, right? Because it's not efficient. It's like throwing paper in a fire. You're gonna have to constantly throw it in there to keep that fire going versus throwing in a carb, which is a log, long sustainable energy. So we're not helping people get energy from that stress state. Does it feel good? Yeah, most people are gonna feel good when they're pumping adrenaline through their veins. 
but you're pushing your body deeper into that hypometabolic state, into that sympathetic to that frozen parasympathetic state. Right. Until they've exhausted those reserves, right? Yeah. So we never know where that threshold is going to come up for somebody. Mm -hmm. Now, is there a happy balance here? Because I mean, our society is so insulin resistant and so many people are, have type two diabetes and there's nothing that will get them out of that state faster than a keto or fasting diet. So it's like, let's, you know, these people can use this, but then we don't want to take it so far. And it's, I think people get so caught up in that, well, it worked for this in the beginning. So now maybe I need to do more carbohydrate restriction in order to keep getting the results. Cause the results always stop. They, uh, they do. It's just, I, I work with thousands of people too, that have been doing keto mm -hmm. and it just stops working. And I always say the same thing, stop doing it and start doing, you know, start putting in your carbohydrates back in again, and you're going to start to lose weight again. It's just that simple. Um, unless well, it is and it isn't because yeah, because the sometimes they're too sensitive, sensitive to the breaking of yeah. the breaking down. Right. So it's going to depend on the person on how you begin to slowly titrate them back in. For some people, a tablespoon is all they can tolerate. Yep, yep. <laughs> you know, so it's coming. It's coming away from the idea that we're speaking high carb here. We definitely don't want to make that mistake, yeah. right? But it's more about finding the balance that's going to help regulate what's happening hormonally in that body, right? And that'll be different for everyone, won't and it? That's going to be yeah. different for everybody, exactly, because where they need that energy is going to vary to, depending on the demand and the state of their metabolism, right? What's yeah. happening in the body? Mm -hmm. So I think that everyone wants to get here, right? But how everyone gets there and where they start is going to be different. Because we have people that come in from fasting. You know, I have people that are 24 that I work with that literally can't poop without an enema, you know, that haven't had their cycle in two years. Why? Because they're coming from the low carb fasting background and it's spun out of control. Yeah. So those people, you know, initially, you know, do they need to get to the place where they're getting, you know, 45% of their diet and carbs? Yeah. But that's a journey. We're talking like eight months down the road, but we start them maybe at 10%. We don't look at it from a percent in our, for we do, but they can't see it. We start really slow. Maybe they get carbs every other meal. Maybe they're getting like a quarter of an apple. We go slow and build them up. Other people that come in, depending on where they're at, they might just be all over the place. We help them create balance. They start at a different place. We have to look at each person and where they're at and how sensitive they are. How much, in a sense, debt they've created over time how much do we have to pay the bank back to get to zero to build their body up we have to look at each person individually mm -hmm. um so yeah it's it is important to make sure that you go slow and look at where you're at um because unfortunately we're living in extremes yeah right um carbs are not the problem right most people that come in with type 2 diabetes is food the problem? Sure, but unhealthy habits are really the problem. So if they go to keto, have they changed anything? No, because they still have unhealthy habits. Did they heal insulin resistance? In my opinion, no, they didn't. They just went to a different extreme to put out the fire because when they go back to trying to eat like a human again, boom, right? Mm -hmm. A bomb's gonna go off. And insulin resistance is not just because of a high carb diet, right? People that eat low carb diets or people that are chronically stressed, right? Or that eat high unsaturated fat diets can have insulin resistance. It's not necessarily because of high carbs, right? So we're just trying to help people find that balance. You know, you are insulin resistant, let's go slow to bring you back to health instead of just going ex one extreme to the other because when you're here, where do you go next when it doesn't work? you go back this way? No, we're just trying to help people find that balance and say, what do you need at the end of the day to regulate your body so it's not in the red all the time? Mm -hmm. and, and so you're sleeping and you're having bowel movements and your energy's more regulated and you can do life, you know, and not be living in a state of fear and really begin to trust your body and what it's capable of and knowing exactly what it is you need, right? right? And really empowering yourself, for, oh, this is what I need, and getting away from trying to find out what you need through something else, right? Yeah. It's all right here. It's all being shown to you. You just have to start to pay attention. And we're being just taught to completely... It's just that extreme. <laughs> totally, yeah. Extremes. We live in yeah. extremes.
carbs, yep. right? Yep. Wow. It's, it's even people with type one diabetes that we work with. We don't cut out carbs. Everyone would think, yeah, I'll put them on a high fat diet. It's going to help them. You know how many type one diabetics we work with that don't do well and we actually have them eat carbs and just in a balanced way it takes time you have to go mm -hmm. slow but it helps them really create a lot of regulation so mm -hmm. um i think you know as a society we think there's a problem how do we just get rid of it overnight unfortunately you have yeah. to put in the work change how you're living create new healthy habits and that's the challenging piece for people yeah and i think the yeah. biggest thing well we, we touched on it a little bit earlier but i just want to say it in a, in a different way maybe is that We've got to regulate the body for any real healing to happen, right? right? We can't right. Just plug one thing in or do a different diet or whatnot. We have to create that regulation. We're never going to do that by excluding a vital macronutrient. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. And then finding the balance, again, is going to be very person specific, but it's really about when you're experiencing your health, it's, it's you observing how your body is able to take on its environment internally and externally. So mm -hmm. you have to look at that environment right. internally and externally and begin to create something that is more supportive to that health. Yeah. Right? And it is about the creating something that right. is that is really going to heal you. Mm -hmm. It's it's not about saying I have to get rid of my kids and quit my job you because can't. you can't do that. It's about it's about adaptability and resiliency. Mm -hmm. And the more you get your body out of that deep parasympathetic or sympathetic state back and you can learn how to bounce in and out of them, you have the resources and you build up your energy and you're producing more mitochondria, what happens is this, the little things that used to stress you out don't overwhelm you anymore, right? You have the resources, you know how to work a way around it, you know how to respond versus react, right? And be with your kids, you know, versus react to every little thing because you're stressed out, you know? So it, that's what it's really about because so many people say, well, I just need to go keto, I just need to go vegan but they still have all the same problems. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to it fix is. you. It's crazy, right? It's not going to yeah. fix you. How do we know this? Because every year a new diet comes out and everyone jumps on it. We're going deeper and deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. We see it. A lot of people don't see it, which helps us a lot in our business. But the funny thing is 15 years ago, you know, we would work with people and help them create balance. Now people are really just effed up. Yeah. We have to go super slow with people, right? And, and they can't even see the light. People are completely frozen and lost, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. how many people do you talk to say, I've tried this diet, this diet, this diet, this Every diet. Day. Yeah. I've done the supplements. I've done the labs. I'm on 10 supplements. And I'm like, obviously they're not working because we wouldn't be having this conversation. You know, they're like, I do red light therapy. I take pregnant alone. I'm doing all these things. It's not working. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's not going to work. It's not going to work because your basic human needs are not met. The foundation isn't there. And you haven't begun to create that change. You know, it's like Brene, uh, Brene Brown says, like, I'm not going to quote her exactly. I can't remember. But it's like, like you, you have to step into the arena right? Which is vulnerability. And if you're not in the arena, she doesn't want to have a discussion. Why? Because you're not there. You don't, you can't relate to it. So we're trying to help people like just have the courage to step up and say, what's not working for me? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. to heal, you can't go back to that place. You don't want to heal and be the old you because the old you is what got you here. Mm -hmm. I just did a podcast episode last week called Stop Bullshitting Yourself. Yeah. And I said in there, I used an example of a woman that I'd just spoken to who said, Oh, I did the uh, bright, I think it's called bright line, bright line diet. And it, it just worked. You know, I had to weigh everything. I did exactly like breakfast, lunch, dinner. I had this portion and it just worked. I lost 50 pounds. And I'm like, stop, but did it fucking work? No, or you wouldn't be here talking to me. It didn't work. Right. You know, like, and people are like, give me the calorie. Like how many calories? Yeah, what, so what's my macronutrient? And I'm like, I'm not going to tell you that. Yeah. It doesn't work. Calorie counting does not work right. and every single one of us is super different like as far as like carb tolerance that. and like you've got to find your own what's going to work for you exactly. so if somebody came to you guys that maybe hadn't been on a keto diet or you know just a normal person coming to you do you have you know a set kind of 
not diet because I don't, I know you don't, <laughs> you're not a set diet, but just like recommendations for just, I'm just thinking of the people that are listening right now. Is there a starting place? What would your advice be to, you know, you know what, you need to have just a balanced, you know, yeah. meal between your the carbohydrates. And that's going to maybe look different as far as what kind of carbohydrates a person can tolerate depending on digestive on system but our, our approach we called rtn approach restoration thyroid nutrition approach it's a four-phase approach that we take people through and everyone that's listening has a thyroid issue <clears throat> has a conversion issue i haven't met one person yet that doesn't yep. and in order to heal anything that you have if you're going well i have menopause i've got issues you know I'm, i have anxiety etc you have to use this approach to get your adrenal thyroid nervous system relationship working better to create the foundation for healing, no matter what else you want to add on top of that. Right. So that's kind of what we call our approach when we take people through. So we have principles. Yeah. <laughs> principles are all about energy production. But yeah. I think the first and foremost, if we're coming into the day in a deficit, we need to replenish. So that whole idea about eating breakfast upon waking within that hour, not intermittent fasting and going 16 hours or 12 hours or however long, it's about getting fuel into that tank and shutting down that survival state, that stress response that the body's in, right? And so that we can regulate blood sugar and set ourselves up for success. What you do from wake to noon time is critical right? As far as regulating, a lot of people will notice that they really tend to binge or crave later on in the day. They can't kind of meet that satiety. And that's because they either wait two or three hours to eat before wait, when, upon waking, right? And their body's already in the red. So now we've pushed it another three hours. Most people are exercising at that time, right? So again, eat when you wake up, provide your body a little bit of glycogen to help replenish those reserves in balance with some protein and fat, right? And then again, if you are in a very, in an energy deficit, and that's going to be, you know, if you have a lot of symptoms, if your body temperature is really low, and that's something that people can do. Take your, take your body temperature upon waking. Is in it bed. In bed in before bed getting down. up. Is it below 97.8, right? Where are we? What is that baseline? And then again, move from that point of view. And the goal is to provide your body meals that are going to satiate you for a period of time, right? We don't want to be chasing that blood sugar. We don't need to be eating every hour. That's actually counterproductive, right? So that's really balance, frequency, right? Finding the rhythm of where your body needs that energy is really, really important. And eating foods that our bodies can digest. So roots, fruits, root vegetables, yeah. starches, winter squash is very, very, very well cooked. We have to meet the body where it is. And we know that when you're in an energy compromised state, you're shut down by 50% digestively. So if we can't, we have to give the body food it can utilize to build those reserves, those, def those deficits back up, right? Right. So again, using those types of foods, using fruits that are ripe and in season or, or well cooked. cooked to again, meet that person where they are. And then proteins, again, it could be um, fish, shellfish, liver, muscle meat, chicken, turkey, whatever it is you want, broth. broth, collagen, those are all really powerful tools, but again, easily digestible depending on the person. Yeah. Some people are not going, we have to consider the state of the digestive system. People are gonna do lighter, yeah. are better on lighter proteins in the morning time where they can, um, and do better on heavier proteins later on in the day when we're more built up metabolically, right? Mm -hmm. So we've had time to fill that tank up a little mm -hmm. bit and regulate the system. This is what we've noticed that works. I mean, I just had a consult yesterday and a consult this morning with a client, and it's, it's amazing to see when people eat in the morning what that does the rest of the day, when they eat consistently throughout the day based on how they need to eat, right? It does so much bang for their buck when they do it consistently over time from that energy perspective, taking the burden off the adrenals, regulating their blood sugar, feeding thyroid health, and storing glycogen. That's what that's what it's all about. It's not just blood sugar, it's storing glycogen to, 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 to get the conversion. So it's that, like Jeannie says, eating close to getting up, eating those metabolic foods that she talked about and doing that consistently throughout the day. I think one more important thing is making sure, she's touched upon it, I just wanna stress it, that each meal has a protein in a carb. Most proteins contain fat. If you want to have fat, go for it. So you're never going to eat a meal that's just protein or just carbs, right? That can have a, a negative effect on our metabolic system. And, and a lot of the stuff we talk about, we're, we're talking about 
20 years of looking at people's our food logs of people and seeing what happens to their energy, how they feel, cold hands and feet, body temperature pulse. We're telling you this, and we always talk about this. There's such simple things, but they're so complex because we don't do them. We're so far from that. You know, I mean, we posted something on Instagram, maybe like a few weeks ago, a month ago, about how important eating when you wake up is. And it's a concept. People wanted me to pr give them research to right. prove why. <laughs> We're human. We need food. Well, it, it, it's that simple. But if you look at the patterns of how people are feeling, right, I don't understand where the concept of, you know, let's not eat food to actually heal. And if you think about it, most people are already fasting, right? Most people don't already eat enough to meet their metabolic needs. So we fast more in the morning. It's pushing deeper into the hole. Right, we just have to support ourselves with the basics. I'm not saying that maybe on top of that things need to be layered down the line, but we've noticed throughout these you know past 15, 20 years that that's a very important piece for people consistently, day after day. It supports the system, gets them out of that stress state, that immune suppressed state, and over time it brings them back to balance. And I just want to bring up a point because I'm, I can just hear people, but I'm not hungry in the morning. I don't want to eat in the that's morning. A, that's information. That's, a, that's adrenaline too. That's a, exactly. It's information. You're so running it's from not mind. about forcing food down your throat. It's about saying I'm not hungry, but I'm also understanding the state of my body and how do I more intentionally, more strategically support that, right? And I know that, okay, I need to give my body some fuel. So let me create something a little more balanced because I know that I'm also really susceptible to blood sugar dysregulation, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what, and then we just meet that over and over and over again. The more we do that, the more we regulate those hormones, we build that resiliency over time by taking the burden off the adrenals, increasing the energy, and now we've created more resiliency to stress. Yes, yeah, right? well. yeah. I just, I've got uh, Michael Platt, Dr. Michael Platt's new book. It's, it's called Adrenaline Dominance. Fascinating. If you haven't read it, read it. He was just on Bulletproof Radio. He's I've got him coming on the podcast next month, but it's it's great. And he talks about the fasting piece being really dangerous if you're not using um some sort of fat in the morning. He suggests MCT oil. I do too. Like I say, if you're gonna fast, especially as a woman, you've got to have that really rich fatty coffee, maybe with some collagen in it in the morning. And only only do it, you know, twice a week tops, kind of thing, two, three times a week at the very most. And then make sure you're feasting afterwards. Like you got to make sure that the next day or that day, the rest of the day, you're eating a lot more. You're eating the food that you're making up for it, right? That, And you have to because you're going to shut down your metabolism if you don't do that. Yeah. yeah so, so we're all about meeting the body where it's at. So we as humans love to make the decision to tell our body what to do. Yeah. Right. We love to be technicians, right? It's, it's, it's the example of like, if you do body work, you go in and as a practitioner, someone says, I have knee pain. You're like, well, I'm going to release the gastroc. I'm going to mobilize the tibia. I'm going to do this and this. That's a technician. Instead of really like assessing the body manually and the body telling you what actually needs to be worked on, what techniques need to be given. Same thing with our approach. We don't say, well, this is what this person needs or like we really look at their logs and their patterns and say, you know what, you might want to fast. You might think fasting works for you in the morning, but guess what? Based on how you feel, based on your body temperature and pulse day after day, based on your patterns day after day, it's not what your body wants. Yes. Right? Yep. We really look at that. Like Jeannie said, some people wake up with no appetite. Our approach isn't cookie cutter. So those people we'd say, have a cup of broth, a little piece of fruit, have a smoothie with some collagen, go liquid. And then an hour later, have like an, or an hour and a half later, have like eggs and fruit or whatever. Or eggs yeah. to Those logs, you're you bringing know? the logs to ground. Yeah. Right? And so many women especially are eating liquid. They're not even eating. They're drinking yeah. liquid. Right, yeah. or they're eating yogurt or whatnot. They're not eating those real log meals that are going to ground and root and stabilize. So again, that just leaves them constantly chasing, 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 and then ending up in greater deficits at the end of the day because they can't meet that caloric need that they need to sustain that demand, mm -hmm. as well as that deficit. That's 
Yeah. I think unfortunately people are so far away from being in touch with what their, their own body. And it's about it that you just got to start small. You got to start somewhere, but you have to start tuning in, quit looking outside yourself, quit looking at the fit pal or whatever it's called, you know, carb (laughs) intake, fitness, my fitness pal app, all of that. Like stop looking outside yourself and start looking within you have to start somewhere if people are just so it's so scary because a lot of people don't have control over their food a lot of people are going yeah that's all nicely said and done but what if i have no control what if i have sugar addiction and you know i have to starve myself in order to you got to start somewhere yeah, but listen to this, and I think she'll agree 100%. So when people sign up to work with us, they get a welcome email with some assessments, a food log, body temperature pulse log. You know, the one thing we've seen over the years is that everyone thinks food is the answer, and I'm not saying it's not a huge piece. It's tangible, it's a gateway, it can help build resiliency and adaptability. But a lot of people's problems are not the food. It's just what we use to control them. You know, people are coming through life with trauma, eating disorders, uh, the list goes on, right? And that's where really the meat is for people. That's really what's causing them to chase all these different diets, right? To fill that void and try to heal. And I'm not saying we're going to sit here and be psychotherapists, but it's just what we've noticed with a lot of people, you know, diet after diet. That's why I always say it's not a nutrition issue that we're having. No, it's not. It's it's bigger than that, right? And we're just trying to control it all with that nutrition. And if what we what we can begin to do is regulate our body with that nutrition, then we begin to build resources internally that allow us to, and through the observation, allow us more opportunity to begin to understand what's happened along the course of our lives that has led us so far away from health, right? Yeah. And then able to begin to do that work. Right. But we have to come from a resource place to be able to tap into some of those deeper places that just right. are difficult. And yeah, that's right? what the food does for people. Yeah. And that's what I've found over this, over this program and in using food in a different way, in such a therapeutic way, is that we weren't just touching on the physical. And that's what so much of nutrition is about just the physical, right? We're tapping into the emotional, we're tapping right. into the spiritual, we're bringing it all together because we're observing our lives from a different perspective. And so it, again, allowing us to create something that's so much more supportive and healing. Oh yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, so what do you guys have to offer then to help these people? <laughs> Well, if you go to our website, eastwesthealing.com, you'll see a box pop up. Of course, you can subscribe like every other website. And you'll get our free restoration diet audio series. Um, we also have some ebooks on our website. We have our cookbook and then two other ebooks that are very inexpensive that you can purchase and they'll be sent to you via email. Um, we do one on one coaching, obviously. Um, and that is talked about on our website, but we also offer a free 15 minute consult to everyone that has questions. It's not a chance for us to sell you. It's a chance for you to talk to us so we can answer some of your questions and fill you in on how our philosophy might help you and then give you maybe like one or two things to walk away with, you know, and then in that we could talk about our consulting if people are interested. Um, so that's something we'll offer. The other thing is, um, I'm not sure when this is all happening with the podcast, but we also do a a group coaching program. We only offer at specific times of the year. And the next one, the registration is actually opening next week to start in January sometime. But we only take 20 people in that group at a time. Okay. And it's on our website as well. Okay, great. Okay, it's coming out in the new year, but you'll have another one, I'm sure, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Don't forget, we have our social media. Our, yeah. our Facebook, you know, is East West Healing. Our Instagram is Real Food Gangsters. We post so much content on there every day, whether it's why, how to, etc. So definitely go subscribe and check it out. Yeah, I subscribed. I liked your guys' little email funnel. I think it was, I thought it was great. Great information. I really want 2020 to be a year of kind of bringing people back from these crazy um, tunnel vision fad diets and really just start turning inward. And you guys are definitely some pioneers in this. So I really appreciate it. And I would love to have you back on the show again, because yeah. yeah. I feel like we could just yeah. keep going. <laughs> All day. 
Yes, yeah. All day long. yeah, I know. Me too. So that's good. <laughs> All right, you two. Thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you.